How's everybody doing today? I hope you take comfort from the song that we just sang, because I know that I do. Whenever I turn my mind to the thought of the victory that we have already been given through Christ's blood, it's, it's refreshing, it's rewarding. You know, the world can beat you down, it can beat you to death, but whenever you turn your mind to the Bible and you read verses like, where, O oh, death, is your victory, where, O oh, death, is your sting, you realize Christ has given us a mighty, powerful victory, and so often we we make that so much less than it really is. So, I mean, keep your, always keep your mind on that. Keep your mind on the victory that's already been won on your behalf. All right, before I get lost in my notes, um, let's go ahead and take care of some housekeeping stuff. Um, I'm going to try to fill Doug's shoes. Um, they're big shoes to fill, but I know I've got to keep you here till one or so to keep you up to expectations. So, um, we may have some filler material at the end, but we'll we'll take care of that. Uh, let's start things off with our uh, confession. I don't want to change that one bit. I love that part of what we do. I am a child of God. I am saved by grace. Amen. I live each day by faith. And I'm ready to hear God's word. All right. Let's do this. Um, if you would, stand with me. I've got a few, ver- I've got a few verses to read. Um, we stand in honor of God's word, as, as Doug always likes to tell us. We're going to go through these verses. Um, and each of those, I want you to keep in mind what we're thinking about here. The, the, the overall theme of this is the fact that God is always with you. Joshua 1, nine. Have I not commanded you? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Isaiah 41.10 Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Matthew 28, 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May, we, may Lord, the Lord look down on us. May he bless us as, he, as we read his word and as we respect his word. I want all of you to stay with me as we think of that. Amen. You may be seated. Kids, I think you got a class, maybe. We're good there. All right. Kids, we, we're good to go. So today, with those four verses, I want you to turn your minds as I go through these things, because we're going to talk about some stuff that can be kind of discouraging, but I want you to keep in mind through all of these verses, especially the one we've got up right now, that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Now, a lot of times we feel distance from God. We feel like he's not as close as we would like him to be. But through these verses, if you believe the promises of God, God tells you, I'm with you always. Jesus told his disciples before he, descend, he ascended to heaven once more, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. The question that I want to address today is one that has went around through philosophers, Christian and non-believer. It's, it's gone through all the world. It's probably gone through your heart at some point because it's something we have as a universal understanding together. And that is, where is God when it hurts? Where is God when we feel pain? Where is God whenever we suffer and struggle? You know, the, the arguments we make for this are often from a theological standpoint. We try to look at what the Bible says on it. We go through verses and we read them to each other. But a lot of times we forget that we're discussing real life when we're talking about this matter. You know, that's not to minimize the importance of the Bible, but sometimes we miss part of the message. We're a lot like Job's friends. We view, that we view it as, um, well, you did something wrong. You're suffering because you sinned. You're suffering because God's trying to teach you a message. And we're, we're, we're often, we're technically right. You know, we're, we're, we're telling things like they are from the Bible standpoint, but we're not offering the correct explanation. We're not giving that full message of pain and how it interacts with us in our lives. So a lot of times we have a helpless feeling around people who are in pain. We don't really know how we're supposed to act. We don't know what questions to ask. We don't know what to say to them to comfort them. So then we do the worst thing we possibly could and we avoid the situation altogether. There are so many people, any of you who have ever been to a nursing home knows the just terrible sadness of watching an elderly person lay there 
living through the last years of their lives and nobody from their family comes to visit them. They've been put away and filed away and left there with no one to take care of them. And that's sad. That's, that's terribly sad. No human being should have to go through that. So instead of separating ourselves from that, we have to remember people are always going to be sick. No matter how much medicine we come up with, no matter how smart we think we've become as human beings, there are always going to be people who are sick. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do to address this, I this issue? What are we going to do to address this pain? Now, when I say pain, I want to make sure that I define that. I'm not talking about pain where somebody says, I have a cold. I'm not talking about pain where somebody says, I hit my hand with a hammer. I'm not even talking about something like a broken ankle. I'm talking about the pain where the doctor comes in the room and tells you that you have terminal cancer. I'm talking about the pain where a doctor comes in the room and tells you that you're going to have a disease for the rest of your life. There's nothing you can do to get rid of it, and it's going to progressively get worse. I'm talking about the pain of dealing with soul-crushing depression, the pain of living with, with the thought that you are no longer whole and there's nothing you can do to change it, the helplessness that comes from that pain. These are the pains that test our faith. They are the pains that make us wonder and make us ask, where is God when it hurts? Now, sometimes those pains aren't anything even directly inside of us. Sometimes it's the pain whenever you're sitting in the emergency waiting room and the doctor comes out and tells you that your child's no longer with you. Sometimes it's the pain that you deal with in losing your spouse after you've been married for three or four years and had expected 30 or 40 or 50 together. It is a pain that is unfathomable until you have been through it. You look on people who go through those things and you think, how are they dealing with that? How can they possibly find the courage to stand up and get off the bed in the morning? Those are the pains that we're discussing today. And too often, visitors don't help with the confusion that you feel. When you're going through that pain, more than anything, you feel confused. You're trying to understand why it's happening. You want to know that there's a purpose to what you're dealing with. And so often, your visitors make it so much more confusing. They say, you must have done something wrong. God has to be punishing you for this. They say, God's trying to tell you something. Think about the message that he might be trying to give you. They, some of them even make you think you're already dead. They come in and they, and they mourn like you're, they're sitting in the presence of a corpse instead of a living person. And so, so many times other people even act like nothing's wrong. They come in and try to put on a comedy show. And in any instance, some of those things are okay, but you have to read each one of those situations before you can make that decision. The most important thing to realize is the world responds more strongly to pain than to anything else that humans experience. You will never meet someone at their most bared soul their most raw, anguished self, as you will, whenever they are in that kind of pain. So since the world responds so strongly to that pain, we should be ready to help them understand. We claim to have the answers. We claim to understand God's will. We claim to understand his word. So we should strive to have an answer to that pain. You know, so many times you hear people say, if your God is so loving, and then they'll ask a question, why did he let the Holocaust happen? Why did he let that bus of children go over the edge of the bridge and all those poor kids die? We're asked those questions, and those are difficult questions. But God does shed insight on these things, and we need to understand it as best we can. One theologian, Augustine, said that American, or uh, one theologian said that people don't experience pain often enough. And in America, I think that's very true. You know, we live lives of comfort. We don't go without food. We are... Uh, we, are, we deal with uh, heating and cooling issues as quickly as we can so that we don't have to deal with the elements. We stay out of the rain. We have vehicles so that we don't have to walk anywhere. And a lot of the pain that the world has experienced, we don't experience. But we still have our share of those crippling diseases that just eat at us and leave us wondering and leave us confused. So let's look first at pain from a biological standpoint, and then we'll address it from deeper spiritual levels. People first often say, why did God even create pain in the first place? And I want you to think about this for a second. Pain serves a purpose as a warning system within your body. If you smash your finger with a hammer, your body immediately lets you know in a way that you cannot ignore, hey, don't do that again. You're hurting yourself. Sometimes you can't help that. You know, it happens, but you're a lot more careful the next time you swing the hammer as a result of it. When you step on a, or put your hand on a stove eye or step on a nail, you don't have a chance to react to that in any other way except get away from the pain as fast as you possibly can. So pain does serve a good purpose for us. It helps us to understand that. So let's look at people who don't feel pain. 
the actual disease of leprosy. You know, in the Bible, leprosy is kind of used as a, a catch-all term for people who are dealing with skin diseases. But the disease that's widely rec recognized as leprosy is a disease that attacks your nerve endings and your skin. And your nerve endings are attacked sometimes to such a degree that if you don't have medical attention, you can't feel anything anymore in your extremities. You're completely numb in your extremities to, to sensation. So what, what does it do whenever we look at it from a modern medicine standpoint in countries where we don't have as much medicine for leprosy? Um, India is the biggest country that suffers from leprosy. And the people there, there's still a big stigma to where those people are shunned by society. They're thrown out into leper colonies and they're told you're not welcome back into the village. So do there's a doctor, his name was Dr. Brand, who worked with a bunch of uh, lepers in India, and he told several stories about things he saw. Um, one, of the, one of the stories that really intrigued me, he said he saw a man who was gardening one day, and the guy looked up and was talking to him while he was working with his garden tool, and the doctor noticed there was blood running down the handle of the rake from his hand, and said finally the man laid the rake down and walked off. When he picked the rake up, there was a nail sticking out of the handle where it had been attached to the, to the metal piece at the end. And he had drug his hand where he couldn't feel anything on that nail until he had done serious damage to his palm. Um, he also talked about people who would wear shoes that were three sizes too small and not even realize it because they couldn't feel their, their feet anymore. And they would actually break their toes. They would cause cartilage and joints to recede until they did permanent damage to their bodies. So without pain, you can see we can do horrendous things to ourselves without realizing. So Dr. Brand went into an attempt to create an artificial pain system for these, for these lepers that were dealing with this. He experimented with, a, with some glasses that they wore that had a flashing light. And he would put sensors on areas of their body where they couldn't feel anything in the hopes that they would, they would create that pressure that was enough to cause pain and they would see the flashing light in their glasses and that would make them realize I'm doing something wrong. But you know what he found is that almost invariably they disabled the system. And I, found, I thought that was very interesting because it was, it was an aggravation to them because they weren't feeling pain, so they didn't realize that anything was wrong, and it started to aggravate them. They just wanted it to go away. Could this be a reason that pain works the way it does? Do you think maybe God did that because he knew if we had scrolling text in our eyes that said, warning, arm is in fire, please remove it, that we wouldn't have responded to that nearly as urgently as we do the sensation of pain? Another very interesting thing about pain is there are no dedicated pleasure receptors in your body. The same nerves that cause you to feel pain also cause you to feel pleasure. So if without that sensation of pain, you also can't feel pleasure. Imagine being a leper and not knowing what it's like to be able to hold your wife's hand, to know the sensation. Something that we take so for granted, they can't even experience. So we should be thankful for everything, including pain. Pain has a purpose in our lives. Um, you know, often also pain is not the end result. We focus on pain, but sometimes pain is the moving from one situation to another, the transition to something better. Any of you in here who have ever played sports know that sometimes the hardest things that you do are the pregame, whenever you're lifting weights, whenever you're running to get faster, the things you're doing to condition your body for the competition leave you in pain a lot of times. But that pays off whenever you reach the finish line ahead of your opponent, whenever you realize that victory where all of your hard work pays off. An even greater example for me is a woman giving birth. I've always thought that that's the most beautiful example of pain giving process to something beautiful, and Jesus mentions that. In John 16, 21, he says, A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. You think this is why mothers have second kids? Any of you who have had children, if you could go back to the very beginning before you had children, and you know the pain you're going to go through, but you also know the joy that that child is going to bring into your life, are you going to be so afraid of that pain that you don't go through the process? It's beautiful to have that life, to have that new child in your hands. And the pain is so minor compared to the glory that you get afterwards. It's the same thing with any pain that we experience in life. So when we see these horrendous pains that we're forced to, under, to, to undergo in this life, imagine how great the reward that comes in response to that pain will be. Augustine also said, Everywhere a greater joy is preceded by a greater suffering. 
you cannot know true beauty until you have gone through the darkness and seen how horrible things can be and then come to know how good they can be. So theoretical talk, you know, we're just speaking at this point about biological stuff. That's just the basics of how pain works. But why do we suffer is something that we, that we still haven't addressed. And as we said, theoretical talk will never cut it. So let's look at it from a, from a different perspective, from a spiritual perspective. There's always the question of, is pain a message from God? That's something that you so often hear. You'll hear these statistics that are rolled off. Christians were more likely to have been killed in this incident. Uh, Christians were less likely. You know, after, I remember after the Columbine shooting, there was a big thing about, did they target Christians? So many of those statistics we get bogged down in, but they don't actually matter that much. That's not really the purpose of any of it. Philosophers have their sweeping generalizations, especially those who don't uh, adhere to the faith that we share, where they will try to just sum up all of human suffering, put it on one little plate and hold it out to God and say, here, deal with it. What, why do you do this? But God created earth, and we're the ones who messed it up. That's something that we forget so often. We act as if God is our servant, not the other way around. We act as if God somehow owes us a perfect life here when we've rebelled against him so often that he would be justified in destroying us and never having anything to do with us again. Pain comes to us for two reasons. One, God established a world that runs on natural laws. And two, human freedom dictates how we use those laws. Now, get, take for an example uh, wood. Wood has a lot of different properties. Two of the biggest ones being it burns easily and it's hard. Those are two, two of the most important aspects of wood. Now, we can use those properties that God gave wood for good or for evil. We can use that for building things. Wood makes excellent structural integrity for a building. So you can use that to form a structure. You can use it to make a baseball bat to play a game. There are all kinds of good things, good quality reasons to use the structural hardness of wood. And the heat aspect gives us fire. You know, so many of our ancestors made their living at night or were able to live at night by burning fire, keeping their hands warm while, it, while they waited for the flocks to come in. So many different ways that they were able to use that heat to help them to cook their food. Um, but then let's take those same properties and let's inject human evil into them. The hardness of wood allows wood to be used as a weapon to murder another human being. The heat and the way wood burns allows it to be used for arson. You can burn property that belongs to someone else. You can hurt other people with it. Human evil does not alter the laws that God has applied to the wood. God has set up a world that runs on those natural properties, and we pervert those properties and use them for evil. You know, we automatically look for meaning when pain comes into the world. Why did that bus full of kids crash, like I said earlier? Why was it my child and not someone else's? Why, what chose me to have to endure this? And again, like the stats that we talked about, some people noticed that it was more believers who died, fewer believers who died. But again, like I said, I don't think any of those statistics mean anything in light of the fact that God made a world that runs on natural laws and human will uses it for so much of this pain. Now that's the pain that humanity involves directly, but let's also look at it from a standpoint of what God's word says about the random aspect of pain. Not the evil aspect where someone has hurt someone else, but the aspect where you come down with an illness that you didn't do anything to, to cause. You were just one of those outliers. It happened to you. God sends rain on the just and the unjust. Why is pain any different? Whenever we, this isn't to say that God directly causes our pain, but whenever we look at the good and the bad of the world, we act like we should somehow be exempt from all of the bad and only be allowed to experience the good. So let's look at the Bible passages regarding this. Starting in the Old Testament, we often see that pain is used as punishment in the Old Testament from God. And I think that's a lot of where our confusion about all pain comes from. Um, you know, we see the flood. We see uh, Ur in Genesis 38, 7. Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. But what about Job? Was Job an evil man? Was Job being destroyed by God for some sin that he had committed? He wasn't. Job spends chapters and chapters talking with his friends who are giving him some of the same answers that we give our friends and family when we go to the hospital. But Job's response was always, I want to talk to God about this. I want to know why I'm hurting. And so often 
when we're going through those soul-crushing pains, we share the words of Job. If only I could meet with God. If only I could talk to God. God finally confronts Job at the end. He gives him amazing imagery of the world he's created. He reminds Job, I created all this. You don't have my wisdom. But he still doesn't give us that direct answer to the question of pain that we really want to hear. So what does it mean when we feel pain that isn't proportionate to our crimes? When we go through those Job times? I want you to consider this first. Have any of you ever received a warning from God just before you underwent a time of struggle? Have you ever, before your punishment started, for, as, as, as our friends would tell us, before your punishment started, been told by God, now this is why this is going to happen to you. That's not the way it works for us. So when we take that approach, when we just look at pain through the Old Testament aspect of it being used as punishment, we're missing a huge part of the pain that we endure in our lives. Does, there, does everyone who gets cancer have some deeply laid guilt? Do they secretly know why they have cancer? Of course not. We know that's not true. But yet that's what we act like so often whenever we talk to people who are dealing with those pains. Jesus, as the example, comes to the front of my mind. I think about the aches and the pains that he undoubtedly felt. You know, he, he, he grew up in a carpenter's household. He probably smashed his, hammer with, his thumb with the equivalent of a hammer, too. He probably dealt with splinters. He probably dealt with his feet hurting after walking for an entire day. He had the same aches and pains we do, and he also felt the agonies of the cross. Yeah. We have no doubt that Jesus shared in our pain and our suffering. And that's the part of God that we so often forget when we're discussing pain. We forget about the fact that God has endured pain like most of us will never know. God came to this earth. He allowed his flesh to be torn. He allowed that crown of thorns to be mashed into his skull. He was whipped. He was flogged. And he had nails driven through his hands and feet. And was raised on the cross and suffocated to death so that we could know freedom. God has chosen to share in the sufferings that we endure. So what is Jesus' answer to pain? I think he might have a little bit of authority on pain. What do you think? In Luke 13, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Jesus understood that pain can be random. He knew that people are not always deserving of the diseases that are brought upon them or the family members that they lose and the pain they go through. The most important lesson, though, that Jesus is telling us here is this. We never know when these random acts are going to come upon us so we have to be prepared for the eternal consequences of not being ready to meet our maker. Unless you repent, you too will all perish. The doctor told me I have three months, Randall, so this doesn't apply to me. How many times have we heard a doctor say, you have three months to live? Sixteen years later, the person's still here with us. You could equally walk out this door today, get in your car, and die in a car crash before you get back to, the to your home. We do not know that the next moment is promised. I may never step off of this platform alive. We do not know what the next breath that we draw is going to bring. So we can never, as Jesus warns us here, be so arrogant to, as to believe that we have more time simply because we're living a righteous life. That does not promise us more time. So we've went through all of this stuff, all of the, the questions. Now let's talk about the responses. How do we as Christians respond to pain in this world? No matter what the cause of the pain, no matter how severe the pain, suffering is always an opportunity for Christians to display the glory of God. Amen. And we have to take every one of those opportunities we can. So why do we suffer? That's the question that we address as Christians. When someone says, why do I suffer? We're all concerned with the cause, but God is concerned with the response. God is looking to... How do these people respond to the pain that they're going through? What kind of response is God looking for? Well, I want you to imagine a life without pain. There's no, there's no sickness. There's no struggle. There's no heartache. None of those things that you deal with on a daily basis. The worry about your loved ones when they leave, to, afraid that you'll never see them again. None of those things are, are there anymore. Well, I'm describing the Garden of Eden. 
That was the situation that humanity initially found themselves in. And God gave us one option to mess it up. And guess what we did? We messed it up. We, we have to look at those responses. Our world is a world full of choices. The way we choose to respond to pain. And heaven is the reward that, that we're looking towards. Excuse me. He's, he's, he's looking for us to have a godly response to those pains and to those struggles. You know, it's, it goes back to Satan's biggest problem with Job. Satan said, to, sa Satan said to God, yeah, Job loves you now. You've made it easy for him. He's not going to love you when this is over. Now, despite, and this is the most important message in Job, in my opinion, despite all of the things that Satan did to Job, Job never turned his back on God. Amen. He always had that hope. God is going to confront me. God is going to tell me why this is happening. God is going to bring me comfort. And that's something that we have to be prepared for. So how do we prepare for it? We don't know how we're going to suffer. None of us know what we're going to go through. You know, if you ask anybody in here who's gone through those terrible times of trial, did you expect that was going to happen to you? There are very few of us that could say, well, yeah, I saw that one coming. Most of us can't do that. So we need to have a strong faith during our health. And I think that's the biggest area that we forget, that we mess up in, in regards to pain. We spend all of the time when we're healthy and we're happy going about our lives, going to work, paying our bills, taking care of the things that are immediately in front of us, fighting fires is the way I like to say it, the, uh, just the things that are crisis right in front of us, and we don't take any time to build our faith. And because of that, when the hard times come, we have no strength built up and ready. Soldiers don't wait until they're ready to go to war to start doing push-ups and pull-ups and learning how to shoot their guns and clean their equipment and take care of themselves. They stand ready at all times, and we are soldiers of Christ. It is our job and our duty to stand ready with our training, with our preparation at any time to suffer and to understand how to go through these things and keep him at the forefront of our mind. James chapter 1 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I think what we forget there is he says, let perseverance finish its work. He doesn't say, rail against your perseverance, be mad until it's over, and then, okay, it's over and now I can be close to God again. That's not what he says. He says, allow perseverance to do its work within you. Allow perseverance to make you stronger so that when you emerge from the fires, you are a more pure and a more whole Christian because of the patience that you have developed. Now, I preached a lesson very similar to this whenever I first started preaching, back when Ozzie Holman asked me if I would, if I would preach. And I pre when I preached that, I was 21, 22 years old. I didn't know what pain was. I was preaching from a, purely from a theological standpoint. But now I have experienced some of the pain that I'm talking about. I've watched people very close and near and dear to my family die long, drawn-out, horrible deaths from cancer. I have, wa I have watched as my own life was torn apart by the depression that has haunted me for years, as I couldn't even find a reason to get up and get out of the beds in the bed in the morning. I've gone through a back injury that left me wondering for three months if I was ever going to be able to work again or if I was going to be stuck for the rest of my life doing nothing. Surviving those types of pain, anybody who's gone through that will tell you, surviving that pain is not a 100-meter dash. That's a marathon. There is no quick way through that. All you can do is hunker down in the foxhole and pray to God and try to maintain the strength that you have. Sometimes when those pains come, there is no advance. Those are times when you sit still and you, ga and you gather your strength for another push, but you can't advance during those times. It's a marathon to continue to the end. We have different reactions to our actions at times of sickness, but the most needed is the presence of Christians. More than anything else, whenever we're hurting, whenever we're struggling, we need our brothers and sisters because that is where our strength comes from. Now, anyone who's been sitting in this room and who's gone through depression like me knows the first thing that disease does to you is tells you you don't need to be around other people. You need to hide in a corner and you need to hide your sorry self away from the world. When you do that, you are giving in to what Satan wants you to do. Because whenever you step away from your brothers and sisters, you give up your greatest weapon to help you survive those times. More than knowledge or wisdom, you know, we've talked about the knowledge of pain, the wisdom that comes from understanding the Bible. 
more than those things, the sick of this world need our love. More than anything else, you cannot convince someone to change, to become a Christian, and to ex- accept the love of Christ until you have shown them the love of Christ. Our faith does not operate through some, th- through some theoretical understanding of this word that never applies to our lives. If we're not living this word, and this word is lived in the hard times as well as the good, we cannot convince them that this faith is something worth having. I would not be here today if it were not for my faith in the promises of God. And that is a lesson that we need to share with those who are hurting. When someone experiences pain, they have been torn back to the most raw aspect of humanity that they can possibly be torn back to. You will never see a more true and real version of a person than you will when they are going through that soul-wrenching pain. When they feel like everything is coming apart and life is no longer worth living. At that moment, you will never have a greater opportunity to witness to Christ. Because pain is the most real and raw thing that you experience. And when you can show them through your own reactions to your pain or through your love in their pain, then you are able to witness to Christ in a powerful way. And if you've never experienced that, I can tell you from experience there is nothing more powerful than experiencing the love of Christ in those those situations. Paul says in Romans 12, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. He gives us our answer there as to how we're supposed to react when we go to someone in pain. We've all been around the people who are able to keep their heads up through their pain, who are happy and it seems like they're invincible to it. They need you to rejoice with them because they are a knife's edge away from falling apart at all times. The people who weep, you need to weep with them. Don't try to cheer them up necessarily. Go to them and give them a hug. Hold them. They just need your presence, and they need to know that you love them. We have to show that we care when someone is suffering. The old saying about you you don't care how much someone knows until you know how much they care, that's more true about Christianity than anything else. Until you show them the love of Christ, they do not care about your theoretical arguments. You have to show them the love before they'll be willing to accept the truth. More than anything else in pain, people need hope. They need to know that there is hope. That might sound silly, but I want you to consider what a lack of hope does. Prisoners of war a lot of times lose hope, and they die from diseases that their body should have easily fought off. But they die because they've lost hope that there's going to be a recovery from their situation. They did a study of 4,500 widowers um, who had a 40% higher mortality rate within six months after their spouse had died because they had given up hope on one of their most favorite, cherished parts of their lives. You look at the Holocaust, Eli Weisel, who wrote a book about his time in one of the concentration camps, said he had friends die from the simplest diseases, sometimes that you couldn't even tell they were sick. They just laid down and gave up. Hope is what drives humans forward. It always has been, and our hope in Christ is eternal. The hope of a prisoner of war can be limited. It can be shackled and beat down. The hope of a Holocaust person who has gone through all of those terrible trials inside the concentration camps can be broken and brought down. Your hope for a better tomorrow can be broken and brought down. But your hope in the faith of salvation in Jesus Christ can never be destroyed by the forces of this world. Nothing in this world can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. And that is a hope that we have to share with the world. As long as the sick draw breath, we can still give them hope. Now, someone who's on their, on their cancer bed and they're dying, they have days at best to live. They don't see much hope. But what if you bring them the hope of an eternity in salvation with Christ? That anyone who still draws breath can be brought eternal hope. We have heaven and the lost can still be saved. Those are hopes that cannot be defeated. You know, those bad days are a lot like Easter Saturday for the apostles. On Easter Saturday, the apostles were convinced that they had lost. Their their leader had been destroyed. The man who said he was going to destroy the temple and raise it again in three days was no longer with them. And as far as they knew, their cause was over. They were no doubt sitting trying to decide, what do I do from here? How do I go back from this to being a fisherman? How do I go back from this into a normal life of obscurity whenever we were promised so much? But we know that Easter Sunday always comes after Easter Saturday. There is always that time whenever we're reminded of the resurrection of hope. The resurrection 
of salvation. The resurrection of all the things that we hold dear in this life that can be dashed to pieces, but which are made new in Christ and can never be taken away from us. When we wonder where God is, we need to remember, one, that he dwells with us always in the form of the Holy Spirit. We never need to sever that connection within ourselves. We also need to remember that Jesus said, I am going there to prepare a place for you. Is there anything more humbling than thinking that Jesus is in heaven right now making a room for you? That he's got a place for you with his Father? That he has given his own life so that you can be in heaven with him one day? There can be no greater hope than that. We so often get lost in our understanding of pain and we forget to look at God's understanding of pain. We claim to want to move into oneness with God in all things. Let's do it with his view of pain too. When we see someone dying, when we see someone on a hospital bed, when we see someone in a nursing home, when we see someone who, has, who is just going through no question the end of their lives, it, this, this is it, they're finished. We're looking at this as human beings with, uh, with complete sorrow. We're looking at it as their life's coming to an end. This person who was once whole and healthy and smiling and laughing is broken down now. They're, they, they've lost their fight and they're slowly decline, declining and there's nothing we can do about it. And there's a sense of helplessness because this is the end. Have you ever thought about at the same time in God's garden in heaven, there's a bloom that's about to open? Have you ever stopped and thought that the angels are gathered around that bloom it, with, with bated breath? They're holding their breath. This guy has almost made it home. They're sitting there waiting for that bloom to open because the bloom in heaven is not like the bloom on earth. The bloom on earth falls to the ground and it wilts and goes away and all you have is memories that are tinged with the sorrow of losing the people that you love. But the memories in heaven are memories that never go away. When you go to heaven, when you become that eternal bloom, that bloom never falls to the ground. That bloom is never affected by the curse of sin. That bloom is never destroyed by the fear of death. That bloom is never separated from those that it loves because it is one with Christ. And we cannot be separated by any power known to man or Satan from the love of our Savior. Amen. Our Savior stands with us forever. And we forget that when we're lost in pain. Pain is the seed being planted that becomes the bloom that we will one day be in heaven. And that bloom never fades. So where is God when it hurts? I think the better question is, where is the church when it hurts? Why are we not doing the work of God? One of my favorite Christian songs is, If We Are the Body. And the chorus says, if we're the body, why are his arms not reaching? Why are his feet not going? And why is his love not showing people that there's a way? We are the feet and the, and the hands and the heart of Christ on this earth. And only we can share this message of hope that cannot be triumphed against by, by Satan. Satan can rail and he can beat against the gates, but he cannot overcome the forces of God. We are his body on earth until the day that he returns. And he takes us to a place that has no more pain. God works with our brokenness. God doesn't, God doesn't work with us in spite of our brokenness. God works with us precisely because we are broken. A clock worker doesn't work on the clocks in his shop that are in perfect shape. He works on the ones that are broken. And God does the same with us. I want you to consider these verses. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and this verse holds a very special place to me. I'm going to share a personal thing with you here. When I was in the depths of one of the blackest bits of depression that I've ever experienced in my life, and I was praying to God, please take this away from me. Make me whole again and take this away. Make me the way I was before. My Bible fell open to this verse. I had been reading from a completely different chapter. I turned my back, and when I came back, I was in this passage. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest in me. Because I am broken, Jesus works in my life. Because I am depressed, God has set me a mission 
to work with those who are depressed. Because Brother Butch is sick, God has set him a mission to work with those who are sick. Because of each and every one of you's experiences in this life, the things that you've struggled with, the things that you've hurt through, you come through stronger so that you can minister to someone else. God has made you a specialized soldier in his army and has given you a mission. And that's not any one of us, that's every one of us. You have all experienced things that give you the ability to witness to people in a way that is powerful and raw. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. God reminds me every time I feel depression coming on. Randall, this is me. This isn't you. You are humbled, and I am humbling you so that I can use you as my witness. He does that to each and every one of you. He breaks you so that he can rebuild you in his image. He breaks you so that he can use you and humbles you so that you will have the power to step forth in his name without arrogance, without personal sense of importance, but so that you can do the will of the one who has saved you. And that is why we struggle with this. If you're new to this church, if this is your first time, if you've been here a few times, know that this church loves broken people. Amen. We are all broken people. There is nothing about any of us that makes us hell and whole and hearty. And we know the struggles that you have gone through. More importantly, Jesus knows any struggles that you have gone through. The Bible tells us that he is tempted in the same ways that we are. He knew the same aches and pains that we do. He knew that feeling that God had abandoned him in times of pain. He stands as your priest in heaven, interceding on your behalf before God. How amazing is that, that the Son of God hears your prayers and intercedes, that he gives that message. If you're not a Christian... You don't have that hope, but it's free to you. God extends his hands to anyone who is willing to accept that message of salvation. If you don't believe that it's going to be beautiful, I'm going to read to you a description of heaven from Revelation as we close. If you want to, you can even close your eyes and imagine this because there's nothing more beautiful in the world than this idea. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth... That's the nasty, ugly place that we inhabit right now had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty... I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. That message is to each and every one of us. Are you thirsty? I know I am. And God's waiting with that water. For any of you who are seeking today, don't put that decision off. There's no greater hope than you can have in the salvation of Christ. I invite you to come while we stand and sing.